Hello and welcome to Space here from the Centre for Astrobiology in Madrid. The scientists here spend their time looking for signs of life on other moons and planets in our solar system. And they do so by taking samples from the most extraordinary places. Welcome to Mars, also known as the Rio Tinto region of southern Spain. is like Mars because the kind of minerals that you find here have been reported on Mars. I mean, uh, in, from the uh, geochemical and from the mineralogical point of view, this is Mars on Earth. Scientists have been coming to this Mars on Earth for 30 years to study the life forms here. Water is very acidic, around pH 2.3, and the uh, oxygen content, as we go down, goes down too, because in the bottom of the sediments is completely anoxic. The big discovery of Rio Tinto is that the iron oxide and sulfuric acid in the water are actually produced by life forms deep underground, living in pores in the rock. And here they are, iron-eating, single-celled organisms. They're in complete darkness, and the life down there doesn't rely on light in any way. Moreover, we could describe it as an oligotrophic environment. That means there isn't much to eat for the microorganisms to survive. Nevertheless, when we started just a few years ago to look at the subsurface, we found there really is lots of life down there. The samples from the Rio Tinto are analysed here at the Centre for Astrobiology in Madrid. They use them as a reference point to study what life could be like on other planets and develop devices to detect it. We want to learn about the microbiology in the subsurface. We want to understand what microorganisms are there and what remains they have left behind. Above all, because we want to test the instrumentation that we have developed to look for life on Mars. If this instrument works in these conditions, where the concentration of life is very low, we think it can also work on the red planet. Mars isn't alone in attracting attention. This place, Jupiter's moon Europa, is another favorite for astrobiologists. A decade from now, Europa will be explored by ESA's JUICE spacecraft. It's a hotly anticipated mission here at the agency's astronomy base near Madrid. The general goal of JUICE is to do an exploration moon by moon of Jupiter, starting out with the outermost moon Callisto, then Ganymede, then Europa, the three moons that are largely made of ice and might have subsurface oceans. And the idea is just to understand those moons. There are intriguing hints about them, that they could be much more interesting places for life than ever, anyone ever imagined a few years ago. Even Saturn's moon Titan has become a target for astrobiologists ever since ESA's Huygens probe found liquid methane and ethane on its surface in 2005. Titan's atmosphere has huge amounts of methane. Where does that come from? And one of the crazier theories that's around is that there might be large amounts of bacteria down underneath the surface and they are producing the methane that fills the atmosphere of Titan. 
Most theories now imagine life existing within the dense, salty oceans beneath the crusts of these icy moons like Europa. And in this lab, the researchers try to recreate those conditions and then study the chemistry of those environments. What we do is we introduce a sample with the chemical that we want to study. We put it into this chamber and submit it to very high pressure, for example, up to 500 times Earth's atmosphere in this case, and up to 10,000 times our atmosphere here, which allows us to simulate the conditions in the oceans of Europa or Ganymede, for example. Nobody believes there's intelligent life elsewhere in our solar system. There are no little green beings, no insects or plants away from Earth. Instead, it would likely be similar to the microscopic organisms in the rock of Rio Tinto. It's not like the life that we grow in a laboratory, for example, where the microorganisms grow in a couple of hours. In the subsurface, we're talking about geological timescales for multiplication. It's a completely different type of life, but they are alive and they're doing well. The discoveries at Rio Tinto have boosted the field of astrobiology. Where only a decade ago speculation on life in our solar system was treated with skepticism, it's now no longer the case. Earth and Mars, they are twin uh, planets. They have the same origin, a little this different distance from the sun, but the, geolo the geology is, is very similar. So if there is life on Earth, why shouldn't be life on Mars? Answers to that question could come very soon. In 2020, the joint ESA-Roscosmos ExoMars mission will head to Mars becoming the first ever mission to dig for signs of life below the surface. And now to the part of the show in which we take your questions about the universe and put them to the experts using the hashtag AskSpace. Now I'm joined by a video link from Houston by astronaut Paolo Nespoli. Hi, Paolo. We've had a question from Michael Kinzer from the United States. He would like to know how astronauts are preparing to deal with long periods in weightlessness and with high radiation on journeys to places like Mars. Well, that's a good uh, question. All this problem, radiation, we could build a, sh a shield, we could build an electromagnetic shield, we could use water to shield. I mean, there are some proposals for something, some better, some less better. I think I think the important part is isolation and confinement. I mean, I, I was thinking, I was on station and I was thinking, you know, I'm here, if there is a problem, I can jump on my Soyuz, my capsule attached here, and in four hours I will be on the ground. What about if I'm on Mars? What are you going to do? I mean, th and, 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 and this starts working in your brain even before you have a problem. So all of this, we need to understand all of this and prepare. And this is what we're doing on the space station. And, uh, and, and again, I'm pretty sure we will understand all of this and we will go to Mars. And I will sign up if I can. Please sign me up. <laughs> Well, thanks very much, Paolo. Well, you can send your questions about the universe using the Ask Space hashtag, and we'll try to answer them. And in the meantime, you can keep up to date with other news from the universe on Euronews.com. Oh. You guys hear me now? 
I think you do. Okay. All right. Sorry. I have myself muted. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's right. Is the volume good? I mean, does it sound all right? Okay. Thanks, Richard. All right. Um, uh, as I was saying, I said, I, I, I you know, I, I've put together this program uh, as part of my kind of learning process to learn microscopy and uh, more about microorganisms. I think that mostly because as an amateur astronomer, I am very, very interested in astrobiology. And so, you know, I felt that, uh, you know, it would be exciting to uh, start exploring the other side of the universe uh, and, uh, and seeing, um, what is, uh, you know, hidden from my view, uh, as far as something being very tiny and, uh, you know, it also helps expand my appreciation of, uh, the cosmos in general, because as I've mentioned before, the universe doesn't start, start and stop by looking up at the stars, you know, it's everywhere. And, um, so, um, uh, I, uh, today I discovered, uh, that, um, I had a culture of paramecium, uh, or paramecia that had large, I mean, the, the population has just exploded. And, um, so I, I was going to talk a little bit about this, uh, uh, microorganism and, uh, I put together a little PowerPoint, uh, presentation, which, Again, this whole process of putting together the PowerPoint presentation, learning how to prepare a slide, um, putting on a show like this is really um, uh, speeding up my uh, knowledge of how to use a microscope and how to image um, uh, uh, such uh, you know tiny objects. So um, I'll start with the pair, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to share my screen here. I, I guess before I do that, I should recognize you guys on, on the show today. Um, so uh, uh, we've got Richard Grace with us. Um, uh, we've got uh, Clear Light 58 here. Book Davies is with us. Um, we've got Mike Wiesner, uh, <laughs> Cameron Gillis, uh, Harold Locke, um, Beatrice Hines, um, who is also interested in astrobiology. Um, and uh, who else do we have? Harold Locke, I mentioned. Um, Yu Chi Yi, yeah, uh, who is being inappropriate here. So we're going to block him. So anyhow, um, and uh, uh, we, um, so let me get into the program with you and uh, we'll learn a little bit more about paramecia uh, together. Uh, uh, you know, if you're familiar with them, uh, uh, you can comment and uh, uh, teach me more, of course, but uh, this is what I've learned so far. And so, um, here we go. Now, paramecia were discovered in the late 1600s. Um, uh, guys like uh, Liebenhoek and uh, uh, Christian Huygens were among the first people to actually see these things. Um, uh, they're called ciliates. And the, uh, the reason why they're called ciliates is they have these tiny little hairs uh, that help them move around and help them eat. And uh, they're also called the slipper animacule. This is how with the animalcule, this is how they were first described. And um, uh, the, um, uh, these objects are objects. These animals are single celled animals. Uh, and this, this, is, this is the first illustration. Um, you know, I love seeing this kind of historical stuff. This is the first illustration of paramecium. This was uh, by an anonymous artist. He did a nice job uh, showing the cilia, which are the fine hairs that uh, the paramecium used to 
uh, you know, they, they whip the cilia in one direction and then they recoil them. And this is how they move around and, and dart back and forth and uh, find their way through water. Um, I don't know how many species there are paramecium or paramecia, but uh, there's quite a few. Um, and uh, uh, these things are tiny. Uh, they range in size from 0 0.0020 to 0 0.0130 inches in length. Uh, they're, all, they're very, very small. They're single cell. Uh, you can see the illustration here. There's, uh, you can see the tiny hairs, which are called cilia. The wall, uh, which is called a pellicle, uh, is, um, you know, it's elastic, but it's, they, it's described as stiff. Uh, when you see the, the paramecium moving around in water, uh, you can see them flip and twist and, and bend. So they're, you know, uh, it's quite flexible. Um, it has an oral groove, okay? And the cilia themselves uh, kind of attract food and move it down towards its, uh, uh, what would be described as its uh, mouth. And, um, and then they move into uh, uh, these food vacuoles. And so inside of the, this, this uh, paramecium is, um, is cytoplasm. And cytoplasm, this cytoplasm has enzymes in it which dissolve the food and pass on the nutrients. And then the waste goes back through an anal pore. Um, so uh, they eat algae and yeast and bacteria. Now, the, the, the beneficial part of paramecium in nature is they keep um, algae and bacteria and other, uh, uh, you know, other um, uh, organisms in check, okay, uh, in, in water, you know, so in our ponds and rivers and, uh, and I think maybe there's even in the sea, um, uh, the paramecium uh, are part of the balance of life. Um, and they also ingest uh, tiny particles of, you know, they didn't really describe what these particles might be or why they might choose one over, over another, but uh, they keep the water clean and, um, and apparently keep it safe. And so that's the benefit to humans. Um, I found that the uh, life cycle of a paramecium and its, uh, uh, and its phases are really interesting. Uh, they can self-fertilize and reproduce asexually through something called spontaneous binary fission, okay? And so this illustration shows some of the binary fission happening where they, um, you know, they make uh, copies of uh, their macronucleus, which has uh, information to control their non-reproductive functions. And then they have something called the micronucleus, which has the genetic material. Um, in just a spontaneous binary fission, what will happen is, is that they just make copies of themselves and, and, and go on down the road. Uh, they also uh, will have conjugation. They'll have uh, sexual conj conjugation and they will exchange genetic material. Now, why they do this when they can just spontaneously reproduce um, uh, is for maybe a couple of reasons. One is, is that um, uh, it would depend on how much food there is, you know, and I guess with certain, sh with a shortage of food, they're going to start um, uh, uh, going through a sexual uh, process. Uh, if, um, and then there's another problem where, uh, you know, paramecium, they can only go through about to, I think it's like 200 fission uh, separations before they start experiencing a lot of DNA uh, damage. Um, the, um, you know, the, so I'm, I'm very curious about the aging process and lifespan of, of paramecium, but I'm also th this uh, process of meiosis uh, where in this process, and I have to learn more about it, uh, it can rejuvenate and repair DNA. And maybe that's something that uh, scientists, you know, are learning about for, on the aging process of humans. 
I'm also fascinated that paramecia can learn, okay? And they have experiments where they have trained, yes, they've trained paramecia. So somebody out there, uh, some scientists maybe have some pet paramecia, okay? But, um, but that is uh, the, um, <laughs> Let me run. Let me run through my slides here. I forgot to share them. Yeah, you're right. It's a busy day. Here we go. And here we go. So this is this is the illustration, first illustration of Paramecia, um, made in 1703. Um, uh, you know, I love it that Christian Huygens, amateur astronomer, was involved in uh, describing them and was so involved in uh, uh, microscopy uh, so early on. So you know, astronomy and, and microscopy are um, are definitely. Uh, uh, you know, hand in hand in the development of, uh, of exploring uh, the unseen world. Uh, this is the illustration here so showing the cilia, the pellicle, um, the oral groove, um, uh, you know, the cell mouth, uh, uh, also the uh, food vacuoles where the food is absorbed into shows the, the area where the cytoplasm is. And in the cytoplasm is uh, our enzymes that digest the food. And then the waste goes out, out through the anal pore of the paramecium. I know that paramecia are, you know, they're predatorial. Uh, they will uh, go and hunt and attack um, uh, to find their food. And they eat uh, yeast and bacteria and, um, I guess some algaes as well. And this is the process showing conjugation, uh, binary fission, uh, you know, so their, their process, uh, they don't have to go through sexual reproduction uh, to reproduce. In fact, mostly they don't, um, but uh, they um, definitely uh, uh, will do it uh, depending on, you know, it seems like the trigger is when they start to have food sh shortages and, um, you know, so they'll temporarily fuse together and they'll exchange genetic material. And we have something, a uh, paramecium that is, uh, you know, uh, genetically richer, um, but uh, also, uh, you know, they, it, it uh, paramecium, there's all different kinds of species. They have to be, um, compatible species. So that's, that's the other part that is interesting to me. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, we talked about the aging process and lifespan a little bit, this process of meiosis, uh, which I still have a lot to learn about uh, uh, for rejuvenation and repair of uh, paramecia DNA, uh, which is interesting. And I think very, very fascinating. I mean, this is just a single cell animal with uh, apparently no brain, okay, uh, but it, it can be trained and can learn. So, so there we go. Sorry about that, okay. So I've got my microscope over here prepared and I am going to, um, I'm gonna put a fresh sample onto the uh, slide here. You guys bear with me for a moment. Here we go. All right. Now my mic, I don't have a microphone over there, but you'll see me working with the microscope. And I'll I'll um I will uh put a drop of uh from my culture in there and you'll see me focus it up or move the uh, microscope stage around a little bit. And then I'm gonna share my screen and I'll come back and talk to you, okay?
है Okay, so you can kind of see these guys swimming around right here. These are fairly large, and I'm, I'm up at, uh, the microscope is set it to 100 uh, magnification, uh, but uh, they're very, very active. Um, I think mostly what they're eating in here is some algae that has grown. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as you study this more, now, I, I, the frame rate that you're seeing right now is kind of is kind of uh, slow. On my computer, it looks a lot more smooth. Uh, but as we're sharing here, you can see that it kind of, they kind of jump around and and um, uh, dart back and forth here. But uh, you know, apparently, this one paramecium is trying to figure his way out. Uh, I believe also there is. Um, uh, some possibly some amoeba in this sample, but this is just a tiny fraction of a drop of water uh, that's in here. And uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Let me... Now, in this view right here, uh, the paramecium that you see kind of stationary down towards the lower right, um, if you look carefully, you can see the cilia that's around it. And it's just, he's kind of stationary sitting there. Uh, you can see uh, food vacuoles uh, there and, um, uh, you know, the different parts of the, of the paramecium that I described before. I don't know what species this particular uh, group is, or, or if indeed maybe they're mixed species, they, they could be, um, but uh, it is pretty fascinating. And um, oh, here comes one up from the bottom. I had another sample that I was looking at earlier today and I think in this one sample, there were over a hundred of them kind of all glommed in there together. And so that's, um, that's kind of my presentation for today. Uh, sorry, I had a couple of full starts. Yeah, you guys are right. I was a little uh, tired today. <laughs> But uh, still, I'm having fun. And um, uh, I, um, you know, hope to, uh, uh, you know, move on to some other, um, you know, specimens that I can be looking at and, you know, just different types. I'm interested in all, all of these different things that are out there because, you know, this is, I just want some familiarity of the whole thing and the way, the, the, the way that uh, the language of microscopy, you know, the vocabulary of it, um, uh, you know, basically the way things are working and everything, because I personally believe that at one point we're going to dig in the mud in Mars and we're going to start to find some stuff. And I would like to have a 
a little bit better than just a, a cursory understanding of uh, of what we're going, what we might see, you know. And uh, I think that it's also very possible that uh, you know uh, we have we have learned uh, uh, that uh, you know chemistry uh, as it exists in space uh, is familiar uh, and the processes processes of chemistry um, pretty much the work the same everywhere that we look at everywhere we look in space so you know the descriptions that um, uh, that uh, um, uh, David Eicher from astronomy magazine was was describing on global star party last time uh, uh, basically you know uh, tells us that we're in a you know things are common we're not in such a special part of the universe we're not we don't occupy you know we're not around a very special star um you know and that um and so that makes me uh think uh, or infer that you know maybe life is not so uh, rare as, as we might think it might be, uh, human beings, every, I mean, every, every, uh, every sentient being, I guess, as, as you might call it, um, uh, is as unique as a snowflake. Uh, however, um, uh, we have many things in common and, um, uh, we, um, you know, uh, we may not find uh, uh, humans or anything like a humanoid type form anywhere, but uh, most scientists, most of the uh, planetary scientists that I talk to um, at JPL do feel very confident that we will eventually find life uh, off of our planet. Um, in the case of Mars, the life may have come from here, it's possible. Uh, the, um, uh, <laughs> Chris Larson says we could be the paramecium in some greater microscope. Uh, that's true. It's all, I guess your point of view, you know, um, and, uh, clear light says statistically, it would be almost impossible if there's nothing else, but, uh, there's nothing else out there. Uh, I would agree with that one. Andrew Corkill is joining us. How are you doing today? It's good. Uh, Book Davies says Asim Asimov, he's talking about Isaac Asimov, has a good short stories uh, like that, um, Chris. Uh, so anyhow, uh, yeah, and so this is, uh, this is my microcosmos for the day. Um, look, if, if the longer you look into this uh, view here, you're going to see uh, many small things move around. I'm going to give it another I'm gonna do a little tour around this little drop of water uh, so that we can see the other paramecium that are there, but you can see that the whole thing is really teeming with life. And so I just find that amazing. Okay, I've kind of zoomed up here and you can see uh, you can see the fine cilia on this this one right here, this paramecia.
this is a good view right here. There's tons of them here. I don't even know how one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, it's just a tiny section. There must be, there's got to be a hundred of them in this drop of water. Um, so anyhow, I, I just, uh, I love it. I think it's cool. Um, and, uh, you know, remember, paramecia are your friend. You know, they're the guys keeping the, uh, your uh, ponds and, and uh, uh, bodies of, you know, standing water for sure. Uh, cleaner and uh, uh, with less harmful bacteria and stuff in them, so. And Steve wants to know, am I using polarized light? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm just using uh, the uh, white light. Um, yeah, there's no social distancing. <laughs> yeah, apparently Paramecia do not know that there is a COVID pandemic going on, so. Um, but, uh, yeah, look at that one. He just kind of, he's getting out of there now. He decided he had to leave. So I'm just, it flabbergasts me that paramecia can, can be trained. You know, so there's, I, I have to learn more about those experiments. Um, but it is possible. Uh, when you see them uh, attack something, I mean, you know that... Uh, that something's happening, you know, they're, they're not just kind of accidentally doing things. So <laughs> someday they will be employees of Explore Scientific. <laughs> if I could get them to work, I and mean, right now they work, they're doing everything for free, you know, I didn't have to have them sign any kind of uh, releases or anything, you know, <laughs> so. Um, Steve says if there's a polarizer, you should use it. You'll get better depth of field and some color. Uh, actually, yeah, I, you know, I noticed that you can get, um, uh, you know, certain, uh, a greater depth of field if I stop down the, uh, the, uh, uh, light condenser and, um, and, you know, there's a lens that's just underneath the, uh, uh, uh the specimen slide that I can adjust the, uh, the uh, aperture. And just like on a camera, you know, you stop it down. Of course, the light is not as intense, um, but uh, depth of field does increase. I will have to use a polarizer and learn, you know, put, I think there's a little filter drawer on this uh, and have to figure that out. So um, I also have a, a, dark, a dark field uh, device and I can try that out and show you how that works.
The dark field is also really cool because it gives a dark background. It side illuminates your specimens. And so you can see a lot of different contrasts this way. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an interesting uh, device to put onto the microscope. Um, it, um, it does require that you increase the exposure time uh, or light intensity. So now I have the iris of the illuminator wide open and uh, um, you know, my depth of field is now a lot shallower. Okay, so focus is a lot more critical. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's, that's it. So you can see there's guys darting over and under, uh, the specimens I kind of have more clearly focused. Um, but, uh, it makes, it makes the edges kind of glow and all the, uh, features kind of show up, um, a little bit better in some regards. It's like looking at almost like a negative, uh, view, but, um, uh, dark field illumination is very handy. And uh, so, but I will have to try out a polarizer and uh, see what that's like. The other thing I have not tried yet is fluorescence microscopy. So I'll have to at one point get into that and, um, and see, you know, what, what that's all about. But um, step by step, you know, I learn more and more. So um, I'll go back to a um, uh, not sharing the view. <laughs> And uh, we'll close. And we're back. So anyhow, um, I uh, appreciate you guys hanging in there with me and learning more about uh, uh, paramecia uh, uh, this, on this Friday. And um, uh, I am getting ready for uh, the next global star party, which is going to happen um, uh, on Tuesday night, Tuesday evening and uh, Wednesday morning. And we're going, I'm trying to get people uh, that can, um, you know, give a live view of the uh, total lunar eclipse of the supermoon. It's going to be the only lunar eclipse of 2021. So, um, you know, so it's just going to be, the trick is going to be finding people with clear skies uh, that, a, that can do it on a, you know, a school night and, <laughs> and, um, and get enough of it where it's a high enough off the horizon. So, um, uh, you know, I will be looking at, uh, perhaps some of our, uh, astronomy buddies down in Australia or New Zealand as well. Um, I know that C Cesar Brolo wants to, uh, uh, participate in this. Um, we've got a couple of others that are, uh, game to do it, but, um, if any of you watching want to participate in the live sharing of the total lunar eclipse, definitely get in touch with me. You can uh, email me at s at explorescientific.com. And I will put that in the message down here. Oh, by the way, someone received an email from someone purporting to me, be me, okay, uh, said Scott Roberts, founder and president or president and founder, and it was an urgent uh, request uh, for you to share your cell phone number. And, um, and then upon doing that, you would get a text message uh, from someone saying that it's me, um, that um, uh, I wanna sell you two $500 uh, you know, gift cards. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Sorry, folks, I don't sell the gift cards. <laughs> so anyhow, but um, uh, definitely email me about the, um, uh, you know, if you're interested in participating in Global Star Party on Tuesday, and uh, especially the live view on early, early Wednesday morning here in the, in the United States uh, will be either afternoon or perhaps a little bit later in the evening for some of you around the world. So um, 
And that's my program for today. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Uh, Arkansas has had some rain, uh, but it looks like it might clear up a little bit. So I'm looking forward to a good Saturday and Sunday. Um, and until uh, Global Star Party, we'll see you then. Take care. Oh, book you wanted to see, I guess before I go, uh, you wanted to show, you wanted me to, uh, to show the micro camera on top of my uh, microscope and I can do that. Hang in there. I'll, I'll, uh, I think we're still sharing. So that's, that's the camera. So this is the camera. It's a Bresser Microcam 2. It's a 3.1 megapixel uh, camera. Um, and it has, you know, you're going to need, at least with our microscopes, you're going to need this little adapter uh, here that takes it down to this, what's less than a one inch diameter size. It's got, a, you know, there's the sensor with the, uh, optical window. It looks like a, it looks like an Astrocam is what it looks like. Um, but uh, it works out really well. It's got a quarter 20 hole for mounting it on a tripod. Not sure why you might want to do that, but maybe you'd put like a, you know, some sort of small lens on it or something. It maybe it could be used as uh, for other applications, but works pretty well for uh, microscopy. I am getting a 20 megapixel uh, camera. So, and that's supposed to be a lot better. So we'll see how it goes, but I'm having fun with this one right now. And, uh, <laughs> and so, um, no, it is, I don't think it's a one inch, I don't believe it's a one inch sensor. And that's not what I said. I said this, Adapter slightly less than one inch is what I said. So there you go. Um, so anyhow, yeah, quarter inch sounds more like it, clear light. That's right. Um, until that time, you guys uh, hang in there and, uh, you know, always do as my friend uh, Jack Horkheimer always said to do, which is to keep looking up. And thanks, thanks uh, for watching all of our programs that we've had this week. Uh, we really love uh, doing them. Uh, we um, we just uh, Kent Martz and I just shot some intro videos and stuff for the Texas Star Party Virtual Edition, which is coming up. Uh, there's a little promo on the on the outros of this program for a Texas Star Party, but it's free. You might as well attend. There's going to be some door prizes. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, TSP is going to bring their game on. So it should be a lot of fun. Take care and, uh, good, e you know, have a great evening. Bye. Hey everybody, Scott Roberts here with Mike Hatch, and we're here at Explore Scientific Live. And we wanted to show you the Bresser line of microscopes. Now we're just showing a few of them here. We've got uh, microscopes that do fluorescence work, some used for metallurgy. Uh, a microscope like this can look at 3D objects, including things like circuit boards, or if you have um, uh, insects or anything like that, this does an amazing job. A lot of these microscopes can also take a camera attachment, which That's is right. great. Like you these know. right here with the trinocular. That's right. And we have a special camera that does that. Some of these other microscopes have a uh, way to attach like your iPhone to them so that you can get images. This one right here has a built-in monitor. So it's pretty cool. Um, the microscopic world is endlessly fascinating, just like astronomy is. And we hope that you take a look. <laughs>
Thank you.